And welcome back. Um, David's discussion was a little emotional to a few of us. Uh, one person came up to me and said, I don't need to have a tearjerker like that again for a little while. Doesn't need to cry that much. But uh, it's, it's really amazing how close the family is. By the family, I mean the family of folks who have either flown in space or have sent people to space. And uh, so, now I've been really looking forward to this panel because back a long time ago, when I had a real job, I was a space shuttle main propulsion systems engineer. And I got the privilege of installing the first main engine to a space shuttle back in 19-aught something. So, and then they decided that uh, the Peter Principle applied and I needed to go and do something I didn't know how to do. And uh, I haven't played propulsion since, except for one or two times. So I really want to you know, see what these guys say about what's going on in the propulsion arena. And we have a local Trudy Quartz. She's the Chief of Human Exploration and Space Operations for Glenn. And she manages uh, the core competencies, core competencies, competencies, three times, uh, in uh, power, propulsion, communications, and structures. And so she's uniquely uh, qualified to lead this panel. So, Trudy. Okay, thank you. Are we on? Are we on? Can you hear me now? No, not yet. Let's get closer. <laughs> okay, can we hear them now? There how about, how about now? Good. I think I was pressing the wrong button. <laughs> Well, thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon. We're towards the tail end of the day. I know it's late in the day. I also know they put out a bunch of carbs just now. So there are breadsticks and cookies out there. So um, if hopefully that doesn't put you to sleep. Um, and if that doesn't, we hope our panel doesn't put you to sleep either. So uh, my name is Trudy Cordes. I am the Chief of the uh, Human Exploration and Space Operations Division at uh, NASA Glenn. Uh, we're thr thrilled to see you all here this afternoon. Um, we hope the next hour provides you many insights into this important topic, which we believe is truly at the center of how NASA will accomplish both its near and far term uh, future exploration plans. So in preparing some opening remarks to kick off this topic, I was struck uh, by uh, where we are in the course of civil, the civil aerospace timeline, as I'm sure uh, much of you have been and how we've have heard about that this morning. Uh, so next week we'll celebrate and reflect on the impressive accomplishments of 50 years ago as we simultaneously look forward to an exciting future with new ambitious plans laid out for the nation, which we'll, we will only accomplish with full participation from government, academia, industry, and international cooperation. So in the most basic definition, propulsion is the act of creating force leading to movement. And if you think about it, that's exactly what we, as a community, have been tas tasked with, combining our efforts to produce a force that leads to forward movement to further space ex exploration. So propulsion in both the literal and figurative terms. So back to the present time. Um, so the city of Cleveland just this week hosted the Major League Baseball All-Star Game, and I'm not sure anybody has mentioned that yet, um, and it, by the way, if you saw the Home Run Derby, I will just say that it was arguably one of the most exciting. I think Guerrero hit 91 Monday night or something like that out of the park, uh, which was really impressive. So I haven't told the panelists this, but that's exactly what I expect you all to do today, hit it out of the park. I have pre prepared some questions for you that are softball, so that'll make it easier for you to do. I'm just kidding, but it is my privilege today to host this group of all-stars of a slightly different nature, each here representing different sectors, academia, industry and government, as well as various but complementary propulsion technologies. So today you'll hear from each of them in their respective areas of expertise, discussing solar electric, nuclear electric, nuclear thermal propulsion from their perspectives and the benefits that each provides for a full suite of future exploration objectives. So one quick programming note before we begin. Um, after each panelist makes their opening remarks, uh, we'll move to the Q&A portion of the hour. So in a plea uh, for help for the moderator, please use the electronic system, the conference I.O. system to ask questions as you think of them as they're speaking, um, and then and vote on them as well. And then we'll moderate that towards the end. So with that said, I'd like to introduce our first uh, panelist. Mitchell Walker is a professor of aerospace engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where he directs the High Power Electric Propulsion Laboratory. His primary research interests include both ex experimental and theoretical studies of advanced plasma propulsion con concepts for spacecraft and fundamental plasma physics. 
Uh, Dr. Walker received his PhD in aerospace uh, engineering from the University of Michigan. Can I get a go blue? Go blue. Yes. That's always a risk for me to say in a room full of mostly Ohioans and a high percentage of which are Buckeyes. So, so thank you for that reception. Um, there, he specialized in experimental plasma physics and advanced space propulsion. His training includes rotations at Lockheed Martin and NASA Glenn Research Center, so there's another tie in there. And in 2005, he founded the Electric Propulsion Program at Georgia Tech. Dr. Walker's research activities include Hall effect thrusters, gridded ion engines, uh, magnetoplasma uh, dynamic thrusters, diagnostics for plasma interrogation and thruster characterization, vacuum facility effects, helicon uh, plasma sources, uh, plasma material interactions, and electronic emission from carbo carbon nanotubes. Whew, that's a lot. And he's authored more than 120 journal articles and conference papers in the fields of electric propulsion and plasma physics. So, Dr. Walker, if you would, please. Sure. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here, Ms. Cortez. Uh, it's always fun to have an opportunity to share my thoughts on electric propulsion, advanced propulsion, and how those things relate to NASA's future. So just to build on Trudy's definition, uh, electric propulsion is the use of electrical energy to accelerate the propellant to make a uh, thrust. And Hall effect thrusters and gridded ion engines are just unique applications of that technology. What really makes electric propulsion different, though, is that you can decouple the propellant from the exit velocity of the engine. And when you do that, you can drive the ISP way up or the efficiency of the engine way up. And that looks at more than an order of magnitude what you can do with chemical propulsion. And the impact of that is now I can take a lot of propellant off of a spacecraft where I can do other things with the available mass. Now, NASA has a long history in success developing and actually flying electric propulsion technology. Uh, the first one was flown in 1964 by NASA. But it didn't really go from being what I'll say is uh, a future technology to a baseline technology until the 90s. And in the 90s, NASA flew the NSTAR gridded ion engine on Deep Space One, and they went out and flew by a comet, and they flew by an asteroid. And then in industry, it was mirrored. They took the electric propulsion devices and they put them on the geostationary communication satellites where they did the station keeping. So there was a coupling there. You advance forward 10 years and NASA now says, let's use electric propulsion as the primary propulsion system on spacecraft. So the Dawn system flies out, it goes around Ceres and Vesta all on electric propulsion, and they were able to do a lot more to orbit two bodies because of the advantages of electric propulsion. Following along, industry said, why don't we use that primary propulsion capability with geostationary satellites? And Boeing came out in 2015 with the first all-electric satellites. And because of the economic success of those, all of the satellite manufacturers followed suit. So those are impressive accomplishments, probably over 50 years. But the future of electric propulsion is just as exciting, if not more exciting, than the past. And that's because there are a different set of requirements and demands for what spacecraft need today. There is a push to large spacecraft, but there is also the ability of, of how do you come up with lots of small EP devices to propel the constellations effectively. So we've had the introduction of lightweight deployable solar array technology, and that has enabled 50 plus kilowatt uh, spacecraft. That's where the power and propulsion element is for NASA. And I will say to the EP community's credit, they have used the opportunity to develop a suite of electric propulsion systems. Instead of just developing a thruster that will turn on at some power level, how do you build out the whole system so that you can actually fly the device? And in a few years because of this, NASA is gonna have a suite of high power electric propulsion devices to go chase things around the solar system. But on the other side, you have the constellations, right? Disaggregation of satellites happened. We miniaturized all of the electronic components. And now there are a plethora of low cost launch vehicles that work at some degree of reliability and there's a lot of private investment going into how do you build these constellations. And many of the constellations have decided that electric propulsion might be one of the solutions to how to keep the whole entire thing up there and make it economically feasible. And so a host of little companies have started up and they're trying to make the right electric propulsion device at rate to actually supply it. Uh, the good thing will be that after all this settles that those electric propulsion devices, low power, will be available to power all of the NASA satellites or the small satellites as they explore the solar system. So uh, to kind of wrap things up, I think the future is really exciting. I think NASA has laid a nice groundwork for a path to a bright future, and I look forward to discussing these thoughts with the rest of the panel. Okay, thank you, Dr. Walker. All right, next up, we have uh, Jim Mazur, 
Uh, Mr. Mazur is the Senior Vice President of Aerojet Rocketdyne's Space Business, U business Unit. Uh, in this role, he's responsible for leading the design, development, test, and manufacturing for launch and space propulsion systems. Jim has more than 32 years of global aerospace experience uh, and leadership spanning entrepreneurial uh, space launch, human space flight, and commercial and military jet engines. Uh, he's held a number of roles within Pratt & Whitney. Uh, including as the Vice President of the F-135 Engine Program and President of Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne, uh, where he was responsible for the design, manufacture, and performance of power and propulsion systems across numerous platforms. Uh, Mr. Ma uh, Mazur graduated magna cum laude from the University of Akron, also another local tie. Zips. <laughs> Go Zips, right? Did I just hear that? Um, with both, both Bachelor and Master's of Science degrees in Engineering, and later he received uh, an MBA from the University of California at Los Angeles. So, Mr. Mazur, if you would. Great, thank you. It's great to be here at the uh, inaugural Glenn Symposium. I, did, I was born and raised in Ohio, and I did go to school at Akron for my bachelor's and, and master's, and NASA, NASA Glenn, NASA Lewis at the time paid for my master's degree. And in return, they assigned me my thesis, which was much harder <laughs> than, <laughs> than uh, my coursework, I can tell you. But it's great to be back and great to be back home. Um, next chart. The reason I have this chart in there is uh, when I think of exploration, we heard Deputy Administrator Morehard talk about the three domains. And I believe he was talking about the three domains of human space flight and, and human occupation, which would be LEO, the Moon, and Mars, which is what we're all striving for. But I think if there was a fourth domain, that domain would be robotic exploration. And at Aerojet Rocketdyne, we've actually been part of propulsion systems. I don't expect you to read all of that, but part of propulsion systems that have touched uh, or been around every planet in the solar system. And in fact, we even um, have part of the Parker Solar Probe, which is at the sun now. And we also had a hand in launching all of these systems. So in addition to the three domains, the, rom the robotic domain is, is uh, important to us. We have a long heritage in it. And um, we look forward to future exploration in the solar system and interstellar exploration. Next chart. Okay, this chart, to build on, on Dr. Walker's uh, preface, I'm glad if there's any technical questions, I'll defer them to my academic colleague. I'm more of a strategy business guy. But, but uh, you can see we're, this is in the higher power he had referred to. So we're working on a lot of higher power systems. We started in, actually in um, the 80s working on arc jet systems using hydrazine. We, were, we moved into, um, in the 90s, in pulse plasma thrusters, then went into Hall current thrusters, and then went into ion thrusters. And the theme behind that is, is the arc jets were around 600 seconds of ISP, whereas you get into the gridded ion we're working on now is 4,000 plus seconds of ISP. And we're also getting the higher power. And so what I wanted to show here is we have a 7 kilowatt next C, um, which is... Um, a gridded ion thruster that's being used for, we're actually building the first flight propulsion system, which includes not just the thruster, of course, but it also includes the power electronics and the uh, fuel, which is xenon and the fuel control, all as an integrated system into a string, which will uh, fly on DART, which is a double asteroid redirect test, which is gonna go out and do some really cool stuff, bump an asteroid, you can read about it, but it's gonna be really fun in the early 2020. So we're, we're building that flight system now, we're gonna get it into test later this summer. And then um, we're working on the 13 kilowatt AEPS, which is a whole current thruster, and that's gonna be used to power PPE that Maxar just won the, won the contract for. And they'll be using two of ours, and I, and I believe a number of uh, BUSEC electric propulsion thrusters at a much lower power in combination to take PPE out and to maneuver in, in uh, NRHO. And then we've been working on, on 100 kilowatt, and this is very much high-tech development, but we view that as being potential for cargo either, well, mostly for uh, planetary cargo to Mars potentially. And I have um, nuclear thermal propulsion down there, and I'll talk a little bit more about it on the next chart. But it's on there because uh, we are investing in that technology, and NASA is investing in that technology a little bit. And although it's not electric propulsion, we think it can do a lot for um, speed of transit. Next chart. So really, I just want to show this is kind of the, the exploration ecosystem that we're operating in. And from a propulsion standpoint, we're looking 
across everything. And I don't even show International Space Station on here, but we're also involved in that. But working in the propulsion for launch uh, with the main engines for SLS and also the upper stage liquid engine for SLS. And as you see the moon and, and gateway, there are gonna be a lot of elements on that. Uh, the PP is the first of the element. There's potentially lo there's, uh, logistics, a HAB, and then there's these, the human lander system, which consists of a uh, transfer vehicle, the lander, and the ascent vehicle. And we're looking hard and partnering with other industry partners on what these lander systems might be composed of. We think for 2024, we've looked at, you know, we have an RL-10 engine that we've throttled down to 10%, which originally um, under Constellation was being developed for the Altair lander, but we did a lot of development there and throttled down to 10%. As you can imagine, when you're landing, you need to reduce your thrust, and so we did a lot of work on RL-10, which is a LAX hydrogen system. But um, from our perspective, in 2024, we're not sure that hydrogen will, will be ready for what you need for these kind of durations, transit times, to handle the boil off. I know there's a lot of cryofluid management going on in that arena. We've been focused a lot on it, and we're working, we're still working the hydrogen systems, but we're also looking at trades against, against chemical storable, which was used the last time we went to the moon. And we've even looked at methane and certainly we have a lot of what I would consider to be off the shelf technology and chemical storable for descent and ascent that probably would be the most reliable and able to meet critical path. But obviously this is all gonna be up to NASA, but we're doing our own studies and, and seeing how that works out. And we're doing the propulsion for the Orion also that will be going um, to the moon. And then as you can see down, there's a cargo route, which we would envision some higher power to take cargo out to Mars. Potentially, potentially could for the moon at a little bit lesser power, it'd have to be studied. And then the nuclear thermal is what I was talking about is, is basically, we heard earlier, you know, the transit time to Mars could be extensive and you have the radiation exposure, or also the other physiological and psychological effects. And the best way to address those is to go as fast as you can. And so we believe nuclear thermal propulsion is one way to address that. And we continue to advance that for the eventual transit of, uh, humans to Mars, and then of course the same thing, landers and ascent vehicles there. So we view this as a long-term play. We talk about the moon feeding forward to Mars, and, and as we look at the technology and the propulsion needed, um, we're looking across the spectrum. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jim. Just uh, some of you in the back can't see, there's a monitor down here. We keep looking down at this, so this is what we're looking at, by the way. Uh, so next, uh, on our esteemed panel. We have Dr. Franklin Chang-Diaz. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chang-Diaz is the chairman and CEO of that Astra Rocket Company, a US firm developing advanced plasma rocket technology and applications in sustainable energy with operations in both Webster, Texas, and Juana Costa, Costa Rica. I hope I said that correctly. Uh, Dr. Chang Diaz founded Ad Astra in 2005 after a 25 year career as a NASA astronaut, a veteran of uh, seven space missions. He's logged over 1,600 hours in space, including 19 hours in three spacewalks. In 1994, in conjunction with astronaut training at NASA, he founded and directed the Advanced Space Propulsion Laboratory at the Johnson Space Center to develop the physics of the Vasmir ro uh, rocket engine. Uh, Dr. Chang Diaz uh, holds a PhD in applied plasma physics from MIT and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Connecticut. He is also an adjunct professor of physics at both Rice University and the University of Houston. So, Franklin, if you would, please. Thank you, uh, thank you, Trudy, and thank you all for inviting me to come over to visit with you in this important uh, gathering of uh, discussion to looking at the future uh, 50 years after Apollo it's time to really look deep into the future. And as you have heard from uh, the previous discussions, it's all about power. It's all about gathering enough power and being able to feed that power to a machine which is compact enough that is able to give you, uh, you know, very uh, excellent propulsion. And that that's, is the, the, the goal of our, of our company. Our company is essentially a spin-off uh, from a laboratory at NASA. We started in uh, 2005 and began developing uh, the final phases of, the, of, of a rocket engine that had been developed uh, or studied uh, extensively at NASA. But then we took the, the company, uh, the project uh, private to, uh, to give it a lot of fuel and move the technology uh, rapidly uh, uh, up the TRL uh, uh, scale. 
So let's go to the, to the slides. If you can go uh, directly to that, that first slide, i just tell you this is what, this is what the uh, engine looks like today. And it has gone through many evolutions over nearly 40 years of development from the early 1980s until, until today. And um, we are dr driving a rocket which uh, is able to give you uh, high power and also high specific impulse. And in addition to that, we would like the specific impulse to be a variable so that we can do um, throttling and moving, uh, essentially changing gears as we go from one point to another in, in space. These are the performance numbers uh, from many, many uh, uh, thousands of shots that we've done with this engine at uh, power levels of 200 kilowatts. So we, we, we tend to, um, to inhabit a niche of power which is um, higher than the, the classic uh, electric propulsion uh, technologies that, that you maybe have heard about. And um, we are interested in scaling up. Our engine doesn't scale down to uh, power levels of a few kilowatts. It doesn't work very well. It scales up to scale power levels of, of megawatts, and it becomes a nice uh, feature for an eventual development of electric nuclear power. And so nuclear electric uh, power which can then uh, drive these types of engines for very high performance and very high speed transportation to Mars and other places. So next slide shows you a little bit about the physics. It is non, um, it is not the traditional electric uh, rocket that we have uh, uh, learned about over many, many de decades, uh, which uh, relies on the extraction of uh, ions and, or charged particles by an accelerating voltage. It is uh, mainly driven by uh, gas dynamics or plasma dynamics, and, and the, uh, the project really um, has its genesis in the uh, U.S. Uh, control fusion program. So it is an open-ended magnetic bottle, essentially, with a very carefully shaped exhaust, which ends up be being a, a, a magnetic nozzle. It is a rocket which um, uh, works uh, with radio waves, so the, the, the means of delivering energy to the working fluid, that is to the plasma, is not by accelerating particles uh, with, a, with, with a voltage, uh, but um, by delivering electromagnetic waves and depositing those waves both in the electrons and the ions together. So you end up with a very high temperature plasma and it is fundamentally neutral. That is, what, what comes out of the exhaust is both ions and electrons. So we don't, never have to worry about um, you know, neutralizing grids or neutralizing uh, guns or anything like that. It's fairly simple in, in construction, uh, borrows a lot of the technology from the fusion program. One of the most important technological features has been the development of superconducting magnets because it is a magnetic enclosure, which is a magnetic pipe, which holds this plasma. Uh, it prevents it from touching anything in the vicinity of, the, of, the, uh, of this high temperature gas. And uh, we're talking about fields of the order of two Tesla, no, very, very high fields, and magnets which uh, need to be very lightweight. So we have one of those magnets already in operation, and it is pr probably the only cryogen-free uh, superconducting uh, magnet of this, this, of this class in the world today. And it is operating in the laboratory today, uh, generating a plasma inside uh, which is close to five million degrees. So it is a, it's a very high temperature um, and high power density device. Uh, you can see in the, in the bottom picture, which actually is, is actually a video, but I don't know if it played or not, but uh, the plasma fires, and we're firing it uh, as we speak today. Uh, we're doing tests for NASA to run this device longer and longer pulses, up to 100 hours of uh, runtime, which is what NASA wants to see. Let's go to the next uh, slide. I just give you a, show, uh, a, a feel for all the applications that we're looking at. We are a private company. Our investors are not so interested in Mars. You know, Mars is not a good business right now. It is more interesting for us to do cargo missions, to do delivery, uh, transportation, essentially the logistics business of space, uh, satellite servicing, satellite 
uh, positioning and so on. Um, reboosting large space stations, for example, such as the International Space Station, which needs to be reboosted uh, periodically, uh, and we can do that as well. Cleaning up the uh, debris, which is all over uh, various layers of or orbital space, and we, we have to deal with that, uh, and as an increasing problem. And um, servicing uh, the, the, the gateway, as NASA uh, would, would want, as they would want to see commercial uh, space dogs that can go and deliver cargo and deliver fuel, food, supplies, and so on. And ultimately, with the help of nuclear power, electric, we can then consider uh, Vasimir engines at uh, megawatt, uh, 5 megawatt, 10 megawatt type engines, which then can make a, a, a mission to Mars very fast. Last, uh, last few slides, I, I just go through them quickly. Uh, this is our technology maturation journey. Just to see that at the end, at the right, right end of the slide, you see we're very close to achieving this 100-hour uh, test that NASA wants. Then after that, we move to the, um, uh, the, the, the construction of a flight engine, which we then uh, would hope to fly sometime in the 2022 time frame. Next, next slide. You see the evolutions of the engine as it, as it is today, 2015 to 2019. The one in the middle is what we're firing today. And then the one in the, in the, on the right side is the TC1Q, which is the 150 kilowatt class engine, which we would be deploying in a, in a typical um, robotic cargo uh, tug. Next, uh, next slide, you can see the size of the engine. Um, the, the superconductor in this case is a high temperature superconductor. Um, and it is, it's got a, um, uh, it's a quadrupole configuration, so the, so the magnetic field does not interact with the Earth magnetic field. It's important to make sure that these magnetic devices don't have a, a, an effect uh, by the Earth uh, magnetic field. Next. Just a couple of slides. This one here is, will be what we would see as a, as a flight demo. And then the last slide is uh, just give you a feel for what we see in the long view a cargo ship for now, which would be powered by solar electric, so not nuclear for, uh, at the beginning, would be solar, uh, at power levels of the order of a couple hundred kilowatts to deliver cargo to uh, places in the vicinity of the Earth and the Moon. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Franklin. I like your golf club comparison. That was nice. All right. <clears throat> and then finally on our, on our panel today, uh, we have Dr. Jonathan Certain, and I'm certain that's how you pronounce his last name because I asked him at least four times after mispronouncing his, his name and calling him Dr. Curtin uh, several times before he uh, graciously and politely corrected me. So Dr. Jonathan Certain is the Vice President of Advanced Technology Programs for BWX Technologies, here and after known as BWXT. In this position, he oversees innovative nuclear technology applications, including engineering for NASA's Nuclear Thermal Propulsion Program, uh, 3D printing technology for aerospace and defense applications, and radiochemical uh, and radiopharmaceutical product development for cancer diagnosis and treat, uh, treatment. Prior to his role at BWXT, Dr. Certain spent nine years with NASA, beginning his career as an astrophysicist and holding positions of increased responsibility at the Marshall Space Flight Center. He concluded his tenure there with the agency as the manager of the Science Research Office, overseeing a staff of 170 scientists and contractors in applied science and technology development. Uh, Dr. Certain earned his PhD, uh, PhD in physics from Montana State, and as a graduate of the Uni uh, University of Memphis, he also holds bachelor degrees, uh, bachelor's degrees in physics and mathematics. So, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Um, it's also my pleasure to, uh, to talk with you today. Um, in 1946, the, the U.S. government, uh, at the conclu conclusion of World War II, started investing in nuclear technology for power. Uh, everyone's familiar with what we use nuclear technology for in World War II. Uh, just a few years later, uh, one of those Manhattan Project uh, uh, participants, Admiral Rick, uh, Rickover, deployed the first nuclear power submarine. Uh, the Nautilus. Uh, he quickly, uh, with the uh, bandwidth offered to him by the Department of Defense, iterated through prototypes and soon found uh, quick use of a variety of different technologies for a number of different subclasses. 
soon after that, we started deploying those on uh, aircraft carriers as we do today. We've seen a number of different other types of deployments for these reactors uh, in, in, the, in the Navy. And since that first Nautilus deployment, BWXT, then Babcock and Wilcox, has been making those nuclear reactors for the U.S. government. To date, we've delivered about 380 nuclear reactors, uh, incident-free uh, um, to, the, to the U.S. government and for, for other uses. Um, for both uh, uh, nuclear use in the sea and for training uh, at various sites across the United States. We've flown over a million miles. And I'll tell you all these things because uh, that is exactly what Dr. Kennedy was talking about this morning. You start with the first of a kind, you rapidly iterate, and then you begin a production line. Uh, we make about three reactors a year for the U.S. government. Uh, it takes us about 4,700 people to do that. 40% of that is quality assurance, and I tell you that because if innovation is to occur in space nuclear, it will require a different approach for manufacturing these systems. Uh, that's why BWX has invested heavily in advanced manufacturing robotics and automated uh, uh, systems and artificial intelligence for these systems. We've been working with the Department of Energy for the last uh, several years in the development of technologies that are applicable uh, for, for nuclear, and, and, a, and a fun anecdote, uh, recently my engineering staff entered the containment area of a can-do reactor in Canada, uh, imaged a system they, they lacked a drawing for, brought that back out, made a three-dimensional representation of it. We printed it uh, using special technology that we've developed in titanium, uh, entered back into containment, installed that component, and it now operates in a nuclear environment and no one here would know exactly how long that took, so I'll tell you, six months. That is unheard of in a regulatory environment that's nuclear, but yet we were able to do that. So, thank you. <laughs> uh, the, the other applications that are of benefit also require a change in the way in which we do innovation. Uh, my boss, Rex Jevedin, hired me into BWX. Uh, Dr. Kennedy also said that sometimes to change the culture, you have to start a new organization. So that's exactly what we did. The Advanced Technology Programs organization uh, within BWX operates independently from the other operating groups. Uh, we're, not a, we're not necessarily uh, to, the, to, ne to the necessary benefit of our stockholders uh, because I don't generate a great, great profit for the company. Uh, but we do develop a lot of different technologies. And so one that I'm particularly proud of is not propulsion, but I'll tell you about it anyway because it's, it's the way innovation should occur in my estimation, and we've been very productive at it. Radio pharmaceuticals work when you take a radioisotope that has some sort of emission paradigm decay during radioactive decay, and sometimes you emit a gamma ray, sometimes you emit an electron, sometimes it's a positron, just depends on the decay type. The, those different radioisotopes can be used for a variety of different purposes. When you attach those things to something called a molecular vector, you can mimic the proteins in the body, and those molecular vectors can attach themselves to very specific locations within the body, a pancreas, a, a, a prostate, a, a heart cell, et cetera. Sometimes those molecular vectors help you image uh, the, the dynamic uh, um, uh, operation of the heart, a heart perfusion study using technetium 99M protectinate, so tech 99 salt water with a, with a heart molecular vector, and you can, you can understand how the heart works. We figured out ways to use nuclear technologies so that we could obviate the need for uranium targets in the production of these uh, radioisotopes, and as a consequence, now have found ways to have no nuclear waste in the production of those radioisotopes, driving down the total cost and increasing the total availability of those products. Other things like lutetium-177 can treat uh, prostate cancer and lutathera and other drugs are now being used to drive down the total lethality rate for prostate cancers from, uh, especially in stage three and stage four, where uh, men with prostate cancer have a seven year uh, um, approximate lifetime span where they used to have seven months. So these types of uh, innovations are occurring uh, within nuclear, but it, it requires a change in approach to the way in which we address regulatory and, and other uh, impediments to innovation. Uh, Jim Ryder spoke about investments in nuclear thermal propulsion, and BWXT is uh, proud to uh, part play a role in that. We've been de developing and deploying uh, fuel test articles to, with Marshall Space Flight Center uh, for the last three years. We've been testing those. We've recently heated several depleted uranium 
uh, fuel test articles at the uh, entries facility at Marshall. We've heated those to well above 2,000 Kelvin. And as Jim pointed out, when deployed in a nuclear thermal propulsion system, the, uh, the change in propulsive capability is, is, is marked. The current version that we're working on with Aerojet Rocketdyne, in fact, would have a 500 megawatt thermal system capable of 35,000 pounds of thrust uh, using an operating environment at about 2,700 Kelvin. That's state-of-the-art materials development required to manufacture such things and turbo machinery that, that operates with chamber pressures heretofore unheard of at those operating temperatures. And we're very close. I told you the story of submarines because the technology is now available for, use, for using high temperature gas reactors in space. I would say the only thing that is lacking is willpower. It's a matter of us deciding that we're ready to do that and us deploying a first of a kind system. And from there, we will see Nautilus to LA class uh, evolution in these systems rather rapidly, just as we've seen in electric propulsion. And eventually we should see in nuclear electric propulsion. So I look forward to the rest of the panel and uh, thank you again for having me today. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, for all of your introductory remarks. So <clears throat> moving on to questions and answers, uh, let's, if you could, each of you talk about the technology advancement required uh, in each of these areas and maybe specifically focusing on some of the challenges associated with getting these technologies ready for future use uh, in terms of, uh, you know, near and far-term exploration plans. Uh, for example, a more powerful SEP system, advancing NTP or NEP or the VASMIR system, um, to a higher tier than it's currently at. So if each of you uh, could address that in some way, or whoever wants to start. Okay, so um, we're focused on solar electric propulsion, which is basically just getting electricity from solar arrays. And as I mentioned, uh, the challenges we have now is we've, we've done a fair amount of reasonable TRL activities and the challenge in front of us now is to build, qualify, and fly first flight systems ever of, of this power and the specific impulse systems. And as you can imagine, um, the transition from development to, to production, and it's not really scale production because there's right now only one use of each of these, and it's our first time through, you can see you run into um, just learnings in general in terms of really are, you man are your specifications proper? Can you manufacture to that? As you run into issues during manufacturing, how do you address them? Could, do you go back and relook at your specs? And it's really trying to translate really what, what is um, early technology development into a production environment. And when you're doing the first one, we're not just doing it with solar electric propulsion. We're actually uh, doing it with uh, the RS-25, which was the SSME, and we're building them brand new from scratch with some design changes. And as you work through the tooling and that sort of things, the first ones generally take a long time. You generally have issues and you generally have uh, learning. And so the challenge with us is getting through that learning and minimizing the amount of issues we have by having a good design in the first place. So, so for, and then for the advanced solar electric propulsion, it's really taking the lessons learned as we go to higher power, uh, potentially higher SPs or, or kind of throttleable ones, is taking the learnings from transitioning the, the past developments into a production environment into the new ones, such when we want to transition those into the production environments. We can apply all the lessons learned. Typically in production, what you would be doing is you come down a learning curve. You know, traditional economics is, is every time you double uh, your production, you reduce your cost by a certain amount, and, and depending, you know, that can be a, a 5 to 10 to 20 percent reduction depending on what it is. The challenge we have in solar electric propulsion is we're building, you know, under 10 of these systems. And so there's not a lot of opportunity for learning curve, but we would expect as we would go from the first to the second to the third to really come down the cost curve on that. And so these low volume systems, high tech developments are, 
challenging to get the cost down, but that's really what we're focused on. Stabilize the design into something producible such that going forward they're very cost effective to produce. So I guess I would answer that question with, with saying everything that Jim said and it's very hard to test a nuclear system on the ground. Uh, there are only a few locations in the United States where you can deploy a nuclear reactor as a prototype and test it. Uh, Idaho National Lab and the Nevada test site are really the, the only two locations uh, at the moment where you can have an active test environment. So testing nu new nuclear systems, there's a real barrier to entry there. Uh, that, but a great first-of-a-kind uh, uh, opportunity is in front of us with uh, STMD support uh, moving forward for a first-of-a-kind deployment of a nuclear reactor in space. Uh, to date, there's no nuclear regulatory agency in space, so it offers us a great opportunity to work around the regulator. Um, so systems like that don't, ha there, there's, there's actually a lot of benefit to doing it that way. There's a lot of data that you can collect from spacecraft these days using a variety of different sensor techniques. We've, we have found ways to use fiber optics for strain gauges, to use new ceramic thermistors for temperature measurements. So you could get all of the traditional data that you need in the operation of a reactor in space that you used to try and collect while on the ground. So there's no real benefit from doing it on the ground if you can take a rapid iteration approach for prototyping. So everything that Jim said, plus uh, working, working through systems to make these nuclear reactors, the only impediment for us, I believe, is the integrated system. I think the, the nuclear reactor core, there are designs out there that we could design or that we could take today off the shelf, build and deploy. There's a lot of technology development that Aerojet and others have done for advanced turbo machinery that we could integrate into these systems and, and test out. So really the only impediment is developing the integrated system, launching it and firing it off and seeing how it works. I just uh, like to point out three areas of technology that we have been uh, working really hard on. One is um, advanced uh, ceramics, uh, ceramics that have to be able to um, be tr um, uh, transparent uh, to RF, uh, RF waves, um, yet uh, be able to operate at very high temperature. See, these are the the, the, the canister that 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 uh, you know faces the plasma. Uh, so the, 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 the first surface that faces the plasma sees a lot of ultraviolet uh, radiation. And so um, the temperature gets up to close to maybe 1,000 degrees C uh, on, on those surfaces. Um, but right outside of that ceramic, there is a, um, a, um, a coupler, or what we call a, an, an antenna, which has to operate uh, at fairly low temperature. Uh, to be able to be um, to, to not incur in a lot of resistive heating, so we want to keep that temperature low. So the cooling, the, the technology for cooling these uh, these devices is very is very intricate. And then um, further out, just a, just a couple of inches above, um, outside of the, that uh, assembly, there is a, a superconductor which is operating at five degrees Kelvin. So it's you know it's extremely low temperature. And so the, the thermal gradients are extraordinary. So that's, uh, th those are important technologies that we're developing. Superconductor is, is cryogen free, so it has no, no fluids flowing through it. It's very unique and it's very lightweight. Uh, the other technology is uh, uh, very compact and lightweight RF generators, which we now have. Uh, these, uh, these generators uh, are in the 90s, uh, 95 to 98 percent efficiency. Uh, they weigh less than uh, maybe half a kilogram per kilowatt. They're extremely uh, uh, lightweight and very robust, and they're getting smaller. Technology with gallium nitride um, uh, um, solid state devices. Um, and, and so the, the, these, these uh, you know, efforts in, in superconductivity, RF generators, and um, materials has shrunk the whole package of this rocket so that you can build a rocket that operates at uh, these power levels at packages of the order of maybe three kilograms per kilowatt. So very interesting in the, in, in the idea of uh, deploying an electric rocket of that power level. 
I want to be very specific about a technology that we could work on. Uh, one of the things that the electric propulsion community never really says out loud is that, yes, we have great performance, but it takes us a long time to do anything because we are limited in power. And this requires the engines to run for thousands to tens of thousands of hours. And what this means is on the ground, I now have to stand up a facility, and when the lifetime is five to 7,000 hours, I run for a year. That's commercial world. But I, when I talk about an engine that's going to run for 20 or 30,000 hours, I now have to have a facility that will run that long. And that means I'm typically launching the spacecraft before my life test is over. And so now I'm going to have to pull in some kind of modeling. But when I run on the ground, I'm in a vacuum chamber. And that vacuum chamber is doing things to the engine that would not happen on orbit. And so I have to create a model that captures not only the performance of the engine, but also what the facility is doing to the engine that would not be there in reality. So if I could invest in something that's really going to move us forward as we look at higher power systems, is how do I do the modeling of life testing so I can reduce the risk of the engine will work as expected? That's my life right now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because we were just talking about this at break. It's exactly that. We're talking about... Um, some electric propulsion that should have a life of 50,000 hours. And we were talking, you know, how can we get comfortable launching stuff into space, especially for some of the, like for commercial where people have to go out and get insurance if you haven't really demonstrated your full life beforehand and the timelines to do that. So we definitely have to figure out, um, are we testing like we fly? And we've had a lot of listen, lessons learned on that, which is kind of the mantra, at least in the launch industry, is test like you fly. You're basically saying um, fly and test, which is the real proof of the environment. And if you can do that quickly and cost effectively, I'd be, I'm all on board with that. But ultimately, it's determining, you know, how can we properly model these systems, which mu much less testing. And, and ultimately what that requires is testing to anchor your models. So we're kind of in a little bit of conundrum, but we're doing a lot of that right now. And we have, we have talked about getting to a certain level of testing where we've got strong thermal equilibrium and we get to what we think would be a relative steady state and then trying to project what, you know, after maybe five or 10,000 hours, what it might look like after 40,000 hours see if we can make the thruster into that configuration and test its end of life and somehow fill the gaps in between. Okay, so that was the softball, that's over. And now the audience is in on the action, so it's time for some curveballs or maybe some fastballs, I'm not sure which. Uh, but how do you propose uh, to have uh, NASA down select amongst your approaches for exploration? Now we as a panel have talked about the complementary uh, applications for each of these uh, technology areas, but um, if, if you could give your thoughts on that. Uh, put yourself in NASA's shoes and then uh, uh, give us your thoughts on how NASA would downselect. Okay. okay, this is dangerous. Um, <clears throat> because I think like a, a businessman, I, I think first and foremost, um, I was excited to hear a goal of 2024 because because I'm not sure exactly what happened, but I think the original plan was 2028, and it sounds like, boy, that's taken a long time. We've already been there. Can't we go faster? Uh, in, the, in the entrepreneurial world and in the innovative environment, you set aggressive goals, and that, that drives focus. So 2024, my mind, drives a lot of focus. Uh, I can't put myself in NASA's shoes, per se, because NASA has, has a lot of constituencies, and they have a lot of competing interests, you know, not just technical, but political. But as a businessman, if I wanted to go by 2024, I'd be looking at, I don't want any, any significant technology development on the critical path. I just want to pick what I think is going to work as fast as I can. And in parallel, I'd be doing the technology development for what enables sustainability and long-term presence on the moon and then feeding forward to Mars. But I'd be, I'd be using whatever technology I had high confidence was gonna work. And maybe you do a couple in parallel. Maybe there's two technologies and you do a runoff between the two and at some point you down select the one. That's a, that's a good way to mitigate risk also. And then I would um, just, just get on with getting the RFPs out and looking at the trades and down selecting and getting people going as fast as I could because 2024 is basically going to say we got to get you know if you're going to do landers we got to be get started on landers really really quickly personally I wouldn't want to see a lot of technology development I'd want to see uh, moving out fast 
and you're going you're gonna to have to start production in parallel with DevQual in order to meet these timelines. That entails risk. Understand how you drive down that risk early on and get going. So I'd be looking at what are the critical paths and what are the things I can do to ensure that I hit my critical paths and if they can't, having fallback plans in place. Long term? I'd like to say that um, you know one size does not fit all. And I think uh, NASA needs to have a portfolio of technologies to, uh, to field its, its mission. And is the mission going deep into space? Uh, you know, clearly, you're not going to use solar electric for that uh, because the sun is too far away, especially if you're going to send human beings. Human beings are going to need a, a lot more than a few kilowatts. So, um, so nuclear power is you know, very clearly uh, something that stands out. Now, nuclear thermal, nucle nuclear electric, well, maybe there are niches in which one shines and the other one doesn't, and so on, and, and vice versa. When we talk about uh, solar electric propulsion, we really are talking mainly in the vicinity of Earth and the moon. But, you know, um, and when we talk about uh, high power, some people think high power is, you know, 50 kilowatts. And to us, you know, high power is, you know, a megawatt and higher. So, you know, you, you got to be able to say where, where the niche is that you are going to operate. And I think that, uh, you know, different technologies fit very well for different things. And we, we, we need to uh, acknowledge that and have a very healthy and robust uh, program that fields all of them. All right. I'm going to ask this because it's the most popular question uh, right now. But... Um, and I wish Jim Ryder was up here with us because I think he'd have the answer right away. But Congress has appropriated significant dollars two years in a row specifically for the development and implementation of a demonstration NTP mission in space. Can anyone tell us the status of that? Uh, I, I did used to work in STMD for a time, and, and I know that they were trying to figure out plans for uh, the ground development of that and the ground testing for that and acquisition. But I've lost lock, lock on that a little bit. Jonathan, I don't know if you have a, 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 a oh, latest so status. I can't speak for NASA, but I can tell you how what NASA ha, has has asked us has asked BWX to do. Um, we are developing uh, near-term technologies and long-term technologies for the applications associated with nuclear. Aerojet's doing the same thing. We're using that information. We're feeding that information into the agency so they can make well-informed decisions about what uh, near-term capabilities exist for for in-space demonstration missions. Uh, STMD has been working not, not just with industry but with other agencies within the government to understand what other applications and other uh, capabilities are needed within other aspects of the government and, and how the other aspects of the government can also help co-fund co that. So there's a lot of common um, um, uh, technologies that are needed across those different use cases for the government and can be uh, provided by industry, and I think STMD is looking at how to develop a balanced approach at deploying that and working with Marshall Space Flight Center and Glenn, looking at both power and propulsion, and they're coming up with a, a plan and a roadmap for that. So I, th I think that they're making progress and they're working hard at understanding how it fits into the, the Artemis and the, and the longer term to Mars uh, deployments. All right, very good. Um, Franklin, there are a couple of questions that are similar uh, for, uh, on the VASMIR technology. How do you protect the spacecraft and payload from uh, the magnetic field? Um, the way you protect the, the spacecraft is by making the magnetic field very compact. And this is the, the concept of why we use a quadrupole instead of a dipole. The dipole is the most, most conventional uh, magnetic uh, configuration. But the quadrupole negates, that is, it has um, the, the basic dipole and a, and a bucking coil around it, which um, neutralizes, essentially, the, uh, the net magnetic moment. And so the spacecraft itself doesn't see a magnetic field of any sort. So th this is the way we do it. All right, thank you. Uh, so going back to um, SEP a little bit, traditional SEP, um, do you see high thrust electric propulsion being realizable within the next 20 years, 50 years? It's relative a little bit, but I think we'll be in the next step. Sure, so the next step. Uh, the entire thing for electric propulsion and thrust is really tied to power. So right now it scales pretty well. 
somewhere between 55 and 80 millinewtons per kilowatt. That means every time you come up with 15 kilowatts, you get about a newton of thrust. So as you drive the power up behind it, the thrust is going to go with it. So it's more power than technology. Okay, and I think we're running short on time, but I'm not sure if we have time for one more. Is there anybody here who can, should we keep going? One more question? Okay, good. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> when might nuclear thermal propulsion be applied to human spaceflight? <laughs> we'll end with that one. Well, so there's a, there, there are two different paths forward. One, one requires a regulator, ground testing. Um, if, if we were to, to develop systems to, to test these up as, as Aerojet and Boeing and others have tested, ground tested rockets uh, since the advent of rocketry, it would be a long time. Uh, standing up a, a, a new uh, NERVA-like uh, test system is a very expensive endeavor. Um, so that, that's one path. Another path would require a series of demonstration missions uh, in space to actually test these systems out and build that capability up. That's why I started my uh, opening remarks with the, the evidence of the submarine. Um, the first deployed system for use in submarines was in a submarine. They didn't build a ground test system and test it out. They built one in a submarine. Since then, uh, they actually have built them out for training so they don't have to send uh, uh, folks in the Navy out, out on boats to become trained to operate those reactors. But the first several uh, were, were tested on uh, and within submarines. In fact, the second one was not so good an idea, a sodium-cooled reactor inside a submarine, sodium being a very good uh, reactant to water, may not be the best thing for submariners if there's a breach of the submarine's hull. So they, they decided against that. So there were lessons learned and, and deployments made, and eventually they got to a stable situation, and now folks are on submarines and aircraft carriers with these things routinely. Okay. So unfortunately, that's all we have time for. I know these hours always fly by, and I know that Space Power Systems is up next. So Jonathan, Franklin, Jim, and Mitchell, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks to the audience for great questions. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.